Listeners just want to give you a quick content warning about this episode. There's a lot of difficult topics covered in this episode of Babylon 5, including dealing with PTSD, the mistreatment of veterans, and wartime trauma. So if that's going to be difficult listening for you, know that before the episode begins and maybe skip this one. You ever done this before? <laughs> oh, I, I've done everything before. <laughs> I don't think that this is appropriate at this particular time. You want me, you bastard! Well, I'm here! I don't sleep with my patients. I found that life is, in general, much easier if I forget most of the things that happened to me. Hello and welcome to Who Are You? This is a Babylon 5 watchcast hosted by two friends who have gotten to know each other and will continue to get to know each other over the show Babylon 5. I'm Jafar. And I'm Laura. And today, Laura, I get to ask you, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Do you know who I am? Well, continuing on a theme from one of my earlier Who Are Yous, this week I am an amateur vet tech because I don't yeah. know if I got I don't know if I got to tell you about this, but we had an emergency situation earlier this week with one of our dogs. Oh no. Yeah. So my peeking is that she's probably between twelve and fourteen years old. We don't know because she is a rescue. Um, is, is that old for small dogs? I've never had a small dog. Yeah, it it's getting up there. Okay. Do they live longer than big dogs, I assume? Yes. Yes. Okay. I actually had a collie that lived to about 14 years, but uh, my mom had a Pekingese last year that she lost at 14. So, okay. I mean, she's she's up there. I just don't know exactly how up there <laughs> she is. And because she is a little old lady, sometimes she gets up in the night very often, mm -hmm. needs to go outside. And so usually my husband is the first one to hear her. And so he will get up and take her outside. And Sunday night, he heard her, got up, opened her crate, and she just kind of stumbled out of it Ooh. and stumbled right into our bed. Like we have a, a platform that has drawers and stuff underneath <laughs> our bed. So she just like rammed right into it. And I, I woke up because I heard him talking to her and... I got out of bed and I looked at her and I was like, oh, God, she's having a stroke. She's got to be having a stroke. That's what this is, right? And I tried to take her outside to see if she would go potty. And she's just like out of it going, going in circles, like falling yeah. over. And we happen to live right around the corner from one of the best emergency vets in the city. So, you know, I'm bundled her up in a towel. I decided I needed to be the one who was driving her in because if she needed to be put down tonight you know i needed to be there mm -hmm. and somebody had to stay home because our son's asleep you know yeah <laughs> so i drove her in at two in the morning handed her over and said i think she's having a stroke they asked me all the questions about everything i sat there for you know a few hours waiting then finally the vet calls me and she says i don't think she's had a stroke but she's having this thing called vestibular disease and I was like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> it's basically like really severe vertigo Ooh. that we would get as people. Um, and they don't know what caused it. She said sometimes it can be caused by like an ear infection because then their mm -hmm. inner ear gets messed up, you know. But she said her ears look great. And, you know, sometimes it's just an old th old dog thing. Actually, if you Google vestibular disease, one thing that pops up is old dog disease. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I All don't. Right, yeah. So it's pretty common, I guess. And a lot of the Google results say it looks like your dog is having a stroke, but they're not. So they treated her. They kept her for 24 hours, put her on fluids. They said basically, you know, it, it clears up usually in three days to two weeks, mm -hmm. depending. And they give them steroids and they give them anti nausea stuff. You know, you just got to keep them eating and drinking. Which is hard because they're nauseous yeah. because they're all messed up. But then they'll they'll get over it on their own. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> but it's it's very distressing to watch. I don't know how many 
problems your pup has had? The current dog is only uh, oh, going to be turning six here pretty soon. Okay. So an adult, but not yeah. senior yet. Yeah. Exactly. But I think I've talked about this on pod. Maybe I haven't. But my dad like trained bird dogs. And mm-hmm. I had multiple dogs in the house growing up for most of my life. Yeah. So I've I've been around old dogs. I've been to, I've been around a number of old dogs over the years. Have you seen this particular thing? I have not. At least not by this name. I'm going to say something that's going to sound probably unnecessarily mean, and I need to make sure that everyone acknowledges that this is coded through the eyes of a child. Um, <laughs> sure, sure. Like, but I feel like my dad might have been a little uh, quick on the trigger when it came to putting dogs down. Oh, <laughs> um, and once again, that is like, I I have to admit that you know it's like well when I was like seven or eight I probably didn't have, you know, the ability to recognize that, and then when I was a teenager I was probably too emotionally connected to be able to make that decision rationally, mm-hmm. um, and then by the time it was happening with the dogs that they had had that were younger then when I was in my twenties I had moved out of the house so my interaction was very limited. Yeah, I think it was different when we were younger, too, though. Yes. I think there was a lot less that they could do. And maybe it's just because I grew up in the country and we had, like, you know, a country vet. There were things that he'd be just like, yeah, this isn't worth trying to treat. You know, it's better to just deal with it humanely. So I, I do feel like I probably do more than my parents would have. Mm-hmm. when they were in my place for my animals. But it's I think it's just a different resources kind of thing. For sure. That's That makes a lot of sense. I mean, people medicine has come very far in 30 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And so has creature medicine. And But yeah, they, they told me, you know, this is going to be distressing to watch, but it will go away and okay. she will be just fine. So I was like, okay, but it is really hard. She can't walk straight still. She she can kind of crab walk her way <laughs> somewhere, which is very funny for a little, you know, dust mop dog to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, we're having to hand feed her right now because she can't like see her dish oh, to get her head. Tough. And she can't bend her head down because she feels like she's falling, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, That's So rough. we're having hand feed and and hand water her basically um she's she's a big mess but they they said it should go away they have to go back in two weeks and make sure that she's doing better okay but she still gets really excited when you bring out the treats so that's how i know (laughs) that she's still herself in there (laughs) yeah (laughs) because she's a very greedy little dog (laughs) so everybody think good thoughts for my puppy dog okay Will do. And hopefully she'll be better by the time you're hearing this message. So, okay. Well, speaking of people having trouble, <laughs> that's not a very good segue. You, you do uh, a better one. You know, we, we got there. You know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, we've got a season two, episode five, The Long Dark. A couple of quick notes. This is part of a series of non-JMS written episodes. This was written by Scott Frost, whose other major TV writing credit is Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. I noticed um, that. And his brother is actually the co-creator of Twin Peaks with David Lynch. Yeah, very interesting. And also, hey, it's Murdoch. That's not where I was going to go with it. Yeah, I I figured (laughs) I'd go for the... uh, uh, Dwight Schultz of Reginald Barkley fame Mm -hmm. is the guest main guest star of this episode. And yeah, we get him pretty quick into this episode. We, We open on CNC and there is a ship approaching... Not from hyperspace, which is weird. Mm. They identify it as the Copernicus. It identifies itself as the Copernicus, I should say. Yeah, it's Um, blasting one of those traditional welcome messages that you see in sci-fi. And then we get uh, cut to a raving lunatic. Our father, who is in heaven, hallowed be the name thy kingdom is uh, done. Thy thy will is something on earth as it is in space oh. and i just gotta say poor Dwight schultz is so typecast <laughs> is he yeah i mean he he is typecast isn't he like he does a great raving lunatic yeah um i haven't seen a team but i'm assuming because 
the character is Howlin' Mad Murdoch, that yeah. there's some lunacy there, perhaps? I mean, I haven't seen A-Team since probably the late 90s, so, but I do feel <laughs> like that is that was the character, yeah. So I, I did Google him just to be like, okay, what else was Dwight Schultz in? And that's where I found the A-Team thing, because I haven't yeah. seen it. But apparently he also had a podcast called the Howl and Mad Podcast. I don't know if he still has it. He might even still have it. Yeah. But he and Jerry Doyle guess, guessed it on each other's shows a lot. So oh. guess what Guess what kind of podcast that was, Jerry. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so, that was... Okay. That was... All right. Well... It was a nut. We're fans of Dwight Schultz acting. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we get Charles stop messing with my brain to commercial. I love that he goes to a porthole in the floor and looks what out a into weird space. Weird place for a porthole. Also, why are there portholes? Yeah, this so many questions about that. <laughs> also, he's supposed to be in down below, right? Yeah, that's the way I took it. The station is a circle, so the mm -hmm. outermost layer is going to be the out like the top layer is going to be the outermost layer and down mm -hmm, below would mm -hmm. be the innermost layer right oh. if it's if it's actually down below if you take the an elevator down to get there it would be one of the centermost layers of the station so there would not be a porthole there that's a very good point yeah but we get this cool scene to theme when we come back from theme we have Amis is the character's name, like a miss, something is a miss, going full Southern Baptist. In just, the Zocalo. <laughs> in the Zocalo, just hellfire and brimstone are coming for you. Yeah. Repent ye sinners. He says to Jakar, and I just really want this to mean something, but I, I don't know. He says, a sound tree cannot bear evil fruit unless it's got bad roots. And I was like, man, I really want that to mean something, but I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to fit that into the story because there's a few very significant lines in this episode. I feel like they yeah, really there's... foreshadow something. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's a bit of that. But I, I was like, I can't quite get there on this one unless he's like referring to some Narn thing that's going to happen later that I don't remember, you know? It happens. So. I mean, I posited a whole theory on our Discord a couple weeks ago about something in an episode, completely forgetting that they had actually gone out of their way and explained it during the show. <laughs> so there's that. And I have recently rewatched the series, and I still forgot that. There's so much. And there's so much lore that happens in just this episode, too. I'm sure yeah. we're going to point it out as we go along. But uh, he also tries to accost Londo after accosting Jakar. Mm -hmm. And then he gets interrupted by Garibaldi, who drags him away. Yep, he gets arrested. Back in CNC, we get some backstory, TM, 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 about this type of old ship uh, used before jump gates. Yeah. I love how Sheridan just knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> he pops in and he's, he knows about these historical pre-jump gate ship designs. Yeah, and he so he messages down to Franklin, and he way too excitedly tells him that there's someone who might need medical attention. <laughs> He's, like, very <laughs> pleased about someone needing medical attention on the ship, the prospect of it. And I guess the thought process is if there is someone on the ship, they're, like, a frozen person from 100 years ago, and he's going to geek out about that. Mm -hmm. But it's just, like, he seemed way too happy about someone needing medical attention to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, just like Franklin in this episode is way too happy about someone needing medical attention. Oh my god, I can't. I'm just going to call it out there. now. I'm still mad, so <laughs> mad, still mad. So the Copernicus gets hauled in, mm -hmm. and for some reason, the senior staff are the first to all go in without a security detail or any technical personnel. Right. <laughs> It's the there's whole a, senior staff. There's a bit of that in this episode where mm -hmm. the things that Babylon 5 is normally good at, they are not doing. And I have mm -hmm. to wonder if it was because this was not written by JMS. I do, too. I really do, too. So they open up the hatch and they see a couple of cryogenic pods. 
Mm-hmm. One of which has a dried up corpse. Looks yeah, like beef straight jerky. up zombie. Yeah. And the other has a very alive and very pretty young woman in it. They open up her pod and a ghost flies out. We get this crazy overhead shot when that happens. Mm-hmm. The camera work in this episode, there's some insane camera work in this episode. Yeah, that is really good. But they rush her to Med Bay. Mm-hmm. And we get the uh, overhead ER style shot of loading in the stretcher mm-hmm. into the elevator. Yeah. And then we get enough flashing lights to get this episode banned in Japan. Yeah. In a security cell, Barkley is having some night terrors. And then Garibaldi's co-worker, I, I can't remember if he gives this guy a name, echoes something I feel like we heard Garibaldi say in season one, that they ought to just space all of the lurkers. Yeah, this guy is clearly the ancestor of an ICE agent. Yeah. <laughs> Not pleased about it. Uh, yeah, Emmis is just muttering to himself in his sleep, remembering his audition for Little John and the Ying Yang Twins. <laughs> to the walls! To the walls! Get to the walls! <laughs> I think it's interesting that Garibaldi actually pulls this guy aside. Garibaldi having been someone that said this exact same sentiment about these people. <laughs> and educates him that this guy is clearly a veteran of the Earthman Bari War. Yeah. Considering in season one, Garibaldi didn't necessarily feel this way. That's true. But but those people also probably weren't veterans. So he might have just been more attuned to it due to his personal experience, which is a big part of this episode. He almost acknowledges that PTSD exists, which for (laughs) 1994, good on you. Yeah. Side Uh, note. I'm probably going to say Barkley a lot accidentally, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that I already have done it. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got him as a miss in my notes, not Amos the entire time, because I read his name and read that that's what it was supposed to be like, and they don't say it until way later in the episode. And right, so I they liter- don't say it till later. They don't say either of the characters' names until much later in the episode, and I just know them from my research ahead of time. But yeah, I, I call him a miss a ton in my notes when it's Amos for the same reason. <laughs> it's just like, that's just how it worked in my brain. Meanwhile, we get Ivanova on the old ship and she full on Fonzie's percussive engineering the old computer back on. <laughs> I like how at first she's just like flipping the switches, you know, the old mm-hmm. NASA switches and then smacks it. Smacks really it and it works. Have, have I told you my story about that? <laughs> no. Have you Have you fixed something by hitting it? I have. Um, nice. So I'm going to out myself, you know, about 20 years later. But when I was a, you know, a kid slash teenager, we had a laptop that was, it was dad's laptop for tax stuff. But mm-hmm. Laura got to play games on the laptop. Okay. And so I dropped said laptop once. Not, you know, on not a huge height. It was like off my bed. Yeah. but. I was like, oh, no, I've dropped dad's tax laptop. And I open it up and try to boot it up. And it says hard drive not found. Oh, no. And I'm like, oh, no, I've ruined dad's tax laptop. Oh, no, I'm going to be in so much trouble. What if he can't get somebody's information, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Oh, God. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, I can't make this any worse, right? It can't find the hard drive. So maybe if I give it a good smack. That'll help. It can't make it any worse, right? And so I I turn it off. I shut it. I give it a good slap, you know, (laughs) boot it back up. Everything worked just fine. It was all there. Windows came back. It's all great. So sometimes it works. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, My inner IT agent is screaming right now. Uh Well, I couldn't tell my dad. Yeah. I mean, I can't complain too much. I literally had a computer start on fire on me once. So, well, I was trying to fix it. So, that's a thing. But Ivanova hears some spooky ghost noises. Yeah. She gets big, uh, I am not alone vibes. Back in the brig, Garibaldi and Amos go back and forth and they talk some real shit. They, They get to have a serious chat. Yeah. It looks like our care of veterans is still something we haven't figured out in 200 years. Yeah, apparently. We find out that Amos and Garibaldi were both Gropos. Yep. Uh, which they explain as ground pounders. And we're going to get that more later, guys. We got um, that a bit 
already? Did we have that? Ep- no, we haven't had that episode yet. Nope. It's nope. coming. It's coming. It's soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we find out that later in this episode, too, that Amos is actually quite a decorated veteran. Mm-hmm. Garibaldi tries to ask him about the night terrors, but he refuses to discuss and tries to leave. Um, Garibaldi tries to recommend a counselor to him, but again, he makes a sarcastic remark and leaves. And just as a note, yeah, if you are a veteran and you feel like you've been abandoned by the VA, I have a number of friends who are veterans and they, all of them are part of support groups outside of the VA. There is a group out there for you somewhere. If that's the kind of support you need, please find it. That's, that, that stuff exists. There are groups that are you can find that are outside of, you know, seeing a licensed therapist where it's mostly just veterans talking about their stuff. You should definitely seek professional help if you need it. But just like, I, it's it sucks. I've I've got a lot of friends who have lost people uh, to stuff like this. Um, yeah, I have more than one friend who has remarked to me that they have lost more of their battle buddies since they got home than they did during active combat. That's so, a real shame. Yeah, just. Know that you're not alone. Get the help that you need. I, I'm i not a veteran. And this just having friends who have had conversations with along some of their more traumatic experiences in combat. This episode was big heavy for me for that. So this is something you've personally experienced and you're watching this episode and you're listening to this podcast. One, I'm sorry that you're probably going through some shit because of it. Uh, but please get the help that you need. Yeah. And at this point for this particular veteran character... Uh, recommending a counselor seems kind of like slapping a Band-Aid on something. For sure. Um, yeah, he he's fallen pretty far down on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and he's needing food and shelter and mm-hmm. counseling. And it, it's, you yeah, know. It's, that's all so far out of reach right now. Yeah. Right. And so many of our veterans get in that situation. So whatever can be done there's help all right all right back to the shitty jokes and the even shittier cgi (laughs) um franklin is there when the sleeper starts to wake up and he is like weirdly petting her it's all right i'm a doctor uh i wrote this down too i said petting her hair fuck (laughs) right i've got a lot of notes like that like fucking stop i think i've got written in the margins of my notes like a dozen times in this episode yeah, I have a lot of swears. <laughs> yeah. Ivanova, we get a quick cut to her and introducing the murder mystery. Do you do? The something, yes, she... something happened. She thinks the system show that the second tube did not malfunction mm-hmm. and that this person who was inside should still be alive. She's convinced it was a murder mystery. But, you know, I wrote in my notes, I was like, you know, the ship is over 100 years old. They barely recognized it. How confident can she be that all the systems are correct? (laughs) I don't know. That was kind of a a plot hole for me. For sure. Franklin conducts an autopsy in the body and notes that the victim is missing all of their organs and that they scanned the ship and there's not a cell left of these missing organs. Yeah, they're just gone. Yep. Something harvested his organs and we don't know where they went. Yep. While this is going on, the now fully conscious sleeper is awake. Franklin goes and talks to her and just has absolutely no poker face. He's just yeah. like, oh, it's been 100 years and your husband is dead. Hi. Yeah. We find out from her that this was supposed to be a deep space exploration mission for for a corporation. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's cool. Corporations going into space. Oh, boy. That's Yay. But she didn't know that they were going to be under for over 100 years and it's pretty shocking that her husband is also dead now Mm -hmm. but meanwhile amos is sneaking into the docking bay to see the copernicus Mm -hmm. but he gets chased away by station personnel and then for some reason franklin takes his patient to the zocalo (laughs) right she gets the very quick austin power style you've been frozen for 30 years catch up oh my god right (laughs) jakar has Probably the best line of the episode here. Take my advice and go back to the time you came from. The future isn't what it used to be. (laughs) I know lots of people who think this way. (laughs) (sighs) She has a flashback to some creature, and Franklin wakes her up, petting her hand. 
in his quarters. And I literally have all caps, dude, fucking stop. I, Just... I all caps, holy fuck. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is wild. This is wild. So he tells her that she passed out and he brought her here because it was closer than med lab. Like, you know what med lab has that your quarters don't, Dr. Franklin? Other yes. people. Other people and Witnesses. other doctors and medical equipment. <laughs> Fucking, oh my God, this is... Franklin tells her that her husband was murdered and she freaks out and then kisses him? <sighs> it's just, dude, stop. And he's all like, this isn't appropriate. And it's like, neither is putting yourself in this position by being alone in your fucking quarters. Exactly. Uh, Ugh. And she says that she kissed him because she's scared? What? What the fuck? What? I, I was going to make this comment later, but I'm going to throw it in now. Yeah. Um, I feel a little bit like this, well, you know, the past in particular, but also still in the 90s. That there was a, a kind of a style of men writing women mm -hmm. characters that is just so unrealistic. Yeah. And I feel like this is a little bit colored by that style of writing. That's just not how women would act. <laughs> like Babylon 5, as a show overall track record, does not have the best examples of this. But right. this is probably... Well, the best examples, when I say of this, I'm talking about of, like, writing women well, <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to put it on the table. Um, This is probably the absolute worst example of it in the series. If there's an episode that's worse than this, it's at the very least not coming to mind right now. I won't deny the possibility of it existing, but right. I feel like this is just fucking miserable. Yeah, it's it's really distracting and really bad. Mm-hmm. Back in the Zocalo, Garibaldi is watching as Adrazi's dinner tries to escape. Yeah, he's having a face hugger for dinner, which I thought was a nice touch. <laughs> I love it whenever somebody's eating, like, a live food on one of these shows. Yeah. You know, like, in Star Trek, you get the gach that's like, yeah. bleh, you know, wiggling all around. Always fun. We see veggies on Garibaldi's plate, though. Oh, so maybe the food plan's sticking. Yeah, yeah. he's got some Brussels sprouts, so good for him. Uh, trying to eat a little healthier. Yeah. We like Brussels sprouts here. We do. We stand Brussels sprouts on this podcast. <laughs> Garibaldi grabs Amos and an alien gets attacked and killed the same way as Mariah's husband. This is another one of those camera work moments, too. Mm -hmm. We get it very much like the Crane killer's cam. POV. Yeah. yeah. But this time when we talk to Amos, he seems much more lucid. And Garibaldi mm -hmm. seems to believe him. He's He's a little more with it. But we cut to Med Lab where Franklin is examining the new body. Yep. Which has also been liberated of its internal organs. Yep. And Garibaldi gives him shit that he 100% mm -hmm. deserves. He's like, you were in your quarters? Like, maybe slow down, Doc. He's mm -hmm. all like, oh, you accusing me of sleeping with a patient? Like, it doesn't fucking matter right now. I'm bringing her to your yeah. quarters, dude. Yep. Come the fuck on. And Sheridan jumps in on it, too. So. Yep. All she should... well deserved. Yep. She... You should not be alone with her. For a number of reasons, the most of which is she's a security risk if she's this monster eating people. Right. Sheridan demands that we get a watch put on her that's not Franklin. Mm -hmm. And Franklin here protests and says, you know, all this on the word of a lurker, which I thought was a weird thing for him to say. It is. Because Franklin is generally pretty good about treating fellow sentient beings with dignity. Well, I mean... But Mm, not in this episode. Not in this episode. He just like threw that guy totally under the bus. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's some very classist weird. Classist bullshit. Yep. Anyways, the League of Non Aligned Worlds calls a meeting to discuss the attacks. Londo's like, find it and kill it. And uh, Sheridan goes full Judge Dredd when threatened. I am the law! Did you notice this League of Non Aligned Worlds actor? Did anything seem familiar about him? No, I missed this. Oh, it's his voice. You've got to go back and listen to his voice. I'm pretty sure this is the same actor as one of our Drawsies in the Purple and Green episode. Oh, well, that's fun. I'm like 100% sure. Okay. <laughs> Aaron turned to me and he was like, that's the same Drawsie. But he's into completely different loaf. He's not a Drawsie here. Yeah. Oh, I just said loaf. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's a different term. Let me let me go back. Uh, he's in completely different prosthetics and makeup here. Mm -hmm. So he's, I don't remember what this type of alien is called. Neither but... do I. You can call it low. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> there's probably a, a non-zero crossover between the two podcasts. I feel so. like there's a, probably a pretty good crossover between the podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> I would say uh... that 95% of our listeners listen to The Greatest Generation. I don't think that's a stretch. Yeah. They, or at the least should. did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I I wanted to say here, speaking of characters acting out of character, you know, this alien representative is talking about forces of darkness showing back up and one of these is on the station, which yeah, it sounds very mystical, very like confusing mm -hmm. and, and not scientifically based, right? But Londo is really cavalier about this whole thing for someone who is cowering in fear in season one when we had the Nocalene feeder. Yeah. That was loose aboard the station. Like, does he not realize this is a very similar situation? Yeah, but that's those were Centauri monsters, so he knows how to take them seriously. Yeah. This is just whatever, just kill it. He's Londo is also admittedly a lot more emboldened right now due to his uh dealings with Mr. Morton. So he might not mm. really feel much along the lines of fear currently. Yeah, he's kind of forgotten where he came from. For sure. <laughs> Garibaldi wakes up in the middle of the night and goes to see a miss to show him where the monster was. He says that the monster looks like the past, which I thought was interesting. Mm, spooky. Um, yeah. Emis tries to use himself as bait, but Garibaldi shares a traumatic war story to stop him. He hears what happened to him in to Emis in return, who tells the story of his unit being killed by the monster. We cut to Franklin and Mariah talking on the sleeper ship and how is this okay that they are allowed in there without security? One, how is it allowed that okay uh, that she's allowed in there when she's chief suspect right now? How is it uh -huh. allowed that she's allowed anywhere with him alone? Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, I I wrote in my notes. I said, you know, they are not visibly under guard. Yeah, she could be destroying evidence or altering records. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be alone together. Yep. And he's got and, her, his hands all over her. Yeah. And they're the talking scene. about a relationship, like romancy stuff for some inexplicable reason. Ugh. And she tells him, you know, her story that she and the husband had a bunch of relationship issues. And Franklin gives her the I'm married to my work thing. But eventually they start talking about what actually happened. And Franklin tries to coax her to remember what was happening in her dreams and then she starts kind of falling in line with Amos's story about I feel like there was something there using me to stay alive. Mm -hmm. um, another attack happens and Mariah shares a similar story to Amos. Senior staff talks about the possibility of using both of them to find the monster and Medlab Garibaldi goes to get Mariah to help. Yeah. Ivanova has a great point here which they just kind of shrug off a little bit that if there's some kind of symbiosis situation happening with mm -hmm. this alien and what it does, that Mariah, especially having been its most recent victim, might be unwittingly working for this alien. Yeah. Yeah, she might not but even we... know. Yeah, she might not even know. And I think that that's something that they should seriously have considered a little harder. <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, if this episode makes it to the reboot having a lot more thing-like twist in it would be interesting. Just leave the doctor part out. Right, please, fuck. In C&C, &C, they get reports that they found the thing, and uh, why don't Ivanova and Sheridan put on body armor? There was a hey, ton of security guards in body armor here. There's a whole bunch of questions I have about this, especially because, you know, if we jump to C&C, &C and Ivanova says, we, we're getting weapons fire in Brown 90. So, the Garibaldi tried to link her. Why didn't Garibaldi talk to her and Sheridan before he went to Brown 90? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And it seems like they should have been in the loop on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Sheridan orders the area sealed off. They're going to go investigate. And Ivanova just hands him a rifle she had right there. <laughs> like, she just, like, reaches under the, the camera view and here's, like, here's your rifle. Yep. <laughs> like, okay, well, maybe we were worried about it, so we started 
that's just the shotgun behind the counter. Like that just made sense to me. But maybe that's just because <laughs> I grew up in Detroit. <laughs> Anyways, Garibaldi finds uh, Amos like floating in midair being held by this thing. Sheridan catches up and shoots it a bunch. And he's just like, we see this flashing lightning cloud. And then the rest of the security detail shows up and they just riddle this thing with bullets. Just light it up to kill yeah. this thing. Just start blasting. JMS was actually really disappointed with how the visual effects in this scene turned out. Really? Okay. Um, I read multiple comments both on Usenet and then also in the episode guide books I have talking about it was just like, this turned out terrible. We spent so much money on this and we've spent so much time on post-production on this one scene and it turned out fucking terrible and I hate it. He's like, it's his Aww. biggest regret of the season. Is wow. how the special I, effects look in this scene. They really didn't bother me that much. There was only one thing that I thought was kind of funny and I've got a timestamp for y'all if you want to go back and check it, but... At timestamp 39 minutes, 24 seconds, it looks like the monster just kicks Amos, just like, <laughs> it looks like a person kicking him over. It's really yeah. weird. Like, yeah. um, but, you know, the, like, just el electricity energy, it didn't bother me that much. So, yeah, okay. I mean, I didn't think it was that bad for considering the rest of the special effects on this show. Yeah. Um, I didn't think yeah. it was significantly worse than anything. It's the 90s, and it was, you know, not CBS or one of the big names. Like, yeah. I was fine with it. After we've killed the monster, we get Mariah back in Med Bay, and she's watching over Amos, it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice to know that he wound up at least surviving the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Franklin tries to convince her to stay on Babylon 5 for some reason. Uh, <laughs> she's like, I'm going to go bury my husband. Yeah. <laughs> I got a hundred years to catch up on. Uh, and then they kiss and she leaves. I don't know. This uh, just, whole thing I did not care about. Yeah. Ivanova updates the captain and confirms from the remaining data on the Copernicus that they were right. The ship lost 10% of its oxygen when it passed by this moon that Amos was stationed on, where they think the monster was picked up on the ship. Mm -hmm. But also, mm -hmm. whatever this was apparently changed the course that the ship was on. Mm-hmm. And it started sending it out to Zaha Doom. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. And then we get to end on Jakar for some reason, as he's examining yeah. an ancient text with a weird-looking monster on Flipping it. Flipping through the Book of Jaquan, and he sees a devil of similar shape to the electricity monster. Ooh. Mm. All right, Laura, I gotta know. I gotta know how you feel about this episode on a scale of Babylon 1 to Babylon 5. Okay, so here's the deal. <laughs> I'm listening. You know, the monster of the week aspect to this, I feel like this is like an infection redo almost. Okay. And it's at the same point in the season. Like infection was episode 4 or something and we're on like episode 5. Mm-hmm. And as a monster of the week, I like it a lot better than I liked Infection. Like, That's fair. I've, I've felt the the story and the fear a little bit more than I did in that one. Even, you know, we watched this with my son, and mm -hmm. he was genuinely a little spooked and frightened by the whole monster thing. And yeah. he said, Mommy, I'm going to have nightmares, which I knew he wouldn't. You know? <laughs> he doesn't really, stories don't really hit him like that, but he was definitely spooked by it. I thought I thought Dwight Schultz did a good job. Agreed. Especially in the times when he got to like, you know, rant and rave a little bit or dis deliver a serious monologue. I really felt Garibaldi like opening up and softening towards this particular predicament of some of these people that are living in down below potentially. Mhm. Mm Same page there I felt too. Like, yeah. It was good. I I felt like he was expanding and empathizing and that was great. To see him go from that space them all attitude to like, oh, wait, you know, maybe this could have been me if things had been just a little different. You know, mm -hmm. he and I were the same kind of soldier. I was a little bit disappointed that, you know, the PTSD, the like delusions, the mental health things that the character went through, the Amos character went through, turned out to be just aliens. Like, it's like, oh. 
it was all this alien that that put a piece of itself in your mind and like I don't read it as that. I mean it that yeah. definitely that definitely made him act crazier for a bit on the station, I feel, the connection with the alien. Uh mm -hmm. but you know, he when he talks about his trauma, he's not talking about, you know, the monster. He's talking about all of his friends getting killed. You know, yeah. they're, like there okay. is still a side to it that is stuff that he has to deal with and that he has PTSD from and that is real trauma, I feel. I don't Maybe think it was just the monster when they, you know, now that the I don't think that now that the monster is gone, he's just magically better. Let me put it that I way. I think it was it was when Garibaldi, like at the end, says there will be no more dreams or something to Amos. It's like, well, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, that already and, died. And don't... And it was just a super dark read on it. <laughs> yeah, and we don't get Amos after that, so we don't get like a yeah. little closure of like, oh, you know, things are hard, but maybe I'm gonna go check in somewhere and and get better or you know something i don't know um <laughs> just just that garibaldi like well now your dreams are gonna go away i was like uh <laughs> fair enough yeah it was a weird yeah. line and then the the whole doctor and mariah thing was very distracting yes so unrealistic it felt like he was acting out of character mm -hmm. she she wasn't fully fleshed out mm-hmm uh, it was kind of insulting to both of the characters, I felt like. Agreed. A huge weakness in this episode. Yeah. Um, so that said, you know, I did like where we were going with the big overarching plot things. A lot of that connection to the shadows, I didn't catch my first time around, like when I watched this as a kid. Yeah. I just thought this was a solitary monster kind of thing. And didn't realize that this thing was actually some sort of shadow servant going to Zaha Doom. It was so very quick that we mentioned yeah. that. Yeah. And there's a bit of it that's a bit more ambiguous because they're not being yes. outright about the shadows in Zaha Doom at this point. It's still kind of just like, uh, there's something out there. Like, it's mm -hmm. killing people. Well, you don't really know what's going on yet. You don't have a good yeah. grasp for what's going on, at least. A lot of the words around it have been vague. They've been like darkness. Yeah. Yeah evil like very big broad words mm -hmm. so i i enjoyed that tie-in once i actually you know could comprehend it so that was enough to keep this out of babylon one for me but i couldn't give it more than a two yeah i think without franklin i think this episode would be a three five for me for sure it's not quite a four yeah. but it's definitely better than a three but mm -hmm. Franklin's behavior is just so jarring in this episode. It just, it, ugh. I can't give it anything more than a two. Yeah, it was, it had to be two for me. Just all of that distraction and plot holes, like things that it's like, this doesn't make yeah. sense. I'll, 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 you know, I'll say 2.5. And that 0.5 is just Dwight Schultz having the time of his fucking life on this episode. <laughs> Because he's he's clearly yeah. just putting absolutely everything he has as an actor into it. Yeah, he was really great. I mean, I one of the things I do when I'm making my notes too is I do make a lot of timestamp notes. Mm -hmm. So whoever's going back and having to get some drops or clips from the episode, but there are so many timestamps I wrote down that were something Dwight Schultz was saying because yeah. it was all perfect delivery. You know, if it wasn't incredibly dramatic then it was very funny <laughs> yeah i mean and that's the episode Dwight schultz i'm sure we'll talk about you in our season two recap but for now we have season two episode six on the horizon spider in the web a killer mm. stalks talia and he has already murdered once aboard b5 talia and garibaldi develop a mutual attraction and sheridan mm. uncovers a conspiracy okay <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a lot. It does. It does not sound like a good episode, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I haven't watched it for the pod yet, so uh, we'll see. I don't remember this at all from my previous watch. I'm sure I'll remember just... stuff when I'm watching it, but just, oh man, from that description, nothing. I thought Talia was done. We've had like three Talia murderer episodes, so. 
Right. I was about to say that. Talia really can't catch a break, can she, huh? Nope. She's there to wipe the minds of murderers. That's her job in the series. Yeah. Mm, cool. Uh, well, I look forward to discussing it with you next yes. week. And thanks to our listeners for joining us for this episode. Thanks to Jeremy Siegel at jeremysiegel42.bandcamp.com for our theme music. Thank you to Angry Duck Time Machine on Instagram who did our podcast art. And if you want to reach out to us, if you want to get a link to the Discord or you just want to tell us about how much you love Dwight Schultz, you can email us at whoareyoub5 at gmail.com. We'll see you next week, Internet. All right, bye. Bye.